All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode with Sharp Education. I know it's been a while. I moved into a different place. I've been a little bit busy, but I also had to plan out what the next chapter of the content was going to be. And with the last episode, we sort of introduced ourselves to it. Uh, it was a bit of a spoiler. I'm going to be doing a new series on integrating economic information, economic data, using the Federal Reserve Economic Database and Yahoo Finance together to make trading strategies that have broader contexts integrated into them. Economic data is the backbone of everything that actually moves the stock market. If you're trading, and you've heard me say it thousands of times probably by now, maybe hundreds, technical analysis doesn't provide an effective context or narrative on what's actually going on in the stock market. A lot of the storytelling that is done in the technical analysis trading space is, is false. It's easy to produce and it's simple to understand, but it's all incorrect. And I'm going to be trying to educate a little bit on the realistic reasons that the stock market moves up and down. I can't speak to the random variance, which we've already gone into with the risk to reward simulation, but I can speak to the general directionality of the stock market. What makes holding equity more appealing? What makes it less appealing? Why does it sometimes continue to go up and up forever? And why does it sometimes pull back really quickly? What, what is, I'm going to be applying the economic background I have from Babson College. I don't have any formal labor experience in economics, but I do I do have um, a pretty solid economic background. It was something I almost concentrated in when I was a u university student, and I was in charge of presenting on it for a couple semesters as well. Anyway, those are my weak qualifications. I do understand the economy or... I understand economics at a pretty high level, so I'll be integrating conversations or narratives into the trading strategies that we're using. Today, we're going to be working with the federal funds effective rate, which is the intrabank rate. It's what the banks can lend to each other. And we're going to be taking this data from FRED, the Federal Reserve Economic Database, and using our Yahoo Finance API as well. So we're going to be blending a lot of information together to build our first trading strategy that is backed by an economic narrative. It's not just bringing in the VIX or whatever. We're, we're actually going to be diving into this at a really high level or maybe low level. I don't know. So let's just get started. All right. So I've got a new file named fedfunds.ipynb. We're going to be making two new cells here. First, to import the packages. Red API as FA. We're going to do the same thing we did in our other project to import those. And... We're going to load in first Yahoo Finance data. That's going to be the first thing we get. So let's go to one of our later projects. Let's go to risk to reward. Our get data function. So I'm taking our get data function from our, I think it was regression changes.ipymb. And I also need to import our global variables there. So, all right. And we also need to import Yahoo Finance as YF below our Federal Reserve Economic Database API. Select the environments. So I've made a small main function here, and we're going to run it at the end just to show you what our data looks like initially. Because we're doing the ticker of the SPY, we are just going to bring in a perfect. And I've also reset the index. Uh, I'm going to make sure we don't do that. I'm going to keep the index as, I think it's a date time. Yes. So now we have the date here. So we used to drop the index in our data frames, which would give us just a zero, one, two, three, four long hour data frame that we're using for the purpose of this study. Going forward, we're going to be taking in some data that might not update daily. The Federal Reserve uh, or the federal funds effective interest rate is adjusted monthly, for example. Uh, they hold an FOMC press conference to assess what it should do. And every month it just stays fixed. There's very little exceptions for that. So the date time index here is going to be a really important part of our study. We're going to be finding where the adjustments are made or we're going to be inserting monthly values and then dragging them down throughout all of the days in our study if we want to do a daily trading strategy. If we wanted to do even more granular where you want to do an hourly study, the federal interest rate might not be as useful or the interest rates might not be as useful. But 
the indexing will be equally important. If you're, for example, using exchange rates, if you're going to load in exchange rates with your hourly data, you're going to need to make sure that the values are indexed properly. So we're going to be needing to do some concatenating and uh, merging based on the date, which we now have defined here as our in date time index. So we've got January 29th, 1993. So, oh, yeah, and so forth for about 30 years. Great. Now, and let's get our Federal Reserve economic data. So let's go back to our other file where we learned how to get it. If we're looking for the Federal Reserve or the Federal Fund's effective rate, then we need to go to the FRED website to find that series ID. But first, I'm going to make a function just to load it in. So let's go back here, define get interest rates. Um, and the function for it looks like this. We need to call our FRED here. We're going to make that a global variable because we will be using it throughout the course of our study. And this function is going to return another data frame. Uh, Fed funds. It's going to be the name of our variable. And we need to replace this with the series ID. So let's go over to Google. Type in Fred and then search for the federal. I'm going to move this here. Federal Reserve. No, federal funds. Wow. Effective rate. And search for it. Should be the first thing that shows up. And look, we have the series ID here, DFF. The Federal Reserve Economic Database has a lot of data. If you type on max, or you select max, it goes way back to 1955. There's a lot of information here, so you can get a really thorough understanding of what's what is the relationship between interest rates and market movements. We're not have access right now to financial information that goes back to 1955. Even the Federal Reserve S&P 500 nominal value is limited to about 20 years, I think. Yahoo Finance has 30, and that's still enough to create a hypothesis or investment thesis. So we're going to load this in with our series ID, head on back to our code base, great, and input this right here, DFF, turn funds. Okay, so notice that we are not concatenating right now in the function. I am going to add some information. I'm going to add some steps to this so it can be harmonious. With the rest of our functions, all we're doing is modifying the data frame with each function. So I would like to eventually say data frame equals get interest rates to and add them to the data frame. But for now, that's not going to work. And I'm going to call this add interest rates. See, um, what we need to do is concatenate everything. So first. Let's get rid of all of this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Our, and if we run this function by itself, df, no, no, rates going to equal data, nope, get, add interest rates. And we don't need df here. You run everything. Should take a second to connect. And let's take a look. Interest rates. Cool. So every month we have a different look at what the Federal Reserve interest rates are. So, uh, I'm be wrong here. This is daily. 26,041 rows since 1954. So yeah, this to be daily. Okay. Well, that's good. The, that means the Federal Reserve Economic Database is updated daily since 1954. That is insane. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to merge this with our original Yahoo Finance information. So we're going to be including what we can do technically theoretically, is include technical information and economic information in the same study. Holy, we're getting really good at this. This is going to be like, like study. If you present this to somebody, you're like, whoa, I got a trading strategy and it's using interest rates. It's, it's any technical indicator you like if, if you think they're valid. I personally don't, but if you like to use them, you can. Um, it's like it's macroeconomic context and a pattern that you think matters. So great. Uh, first, before I get ahead of myself again, let's move on to merging these things. So remember, I had this argument here. We're going to add it to the data frame. But the issue is we can't just put them next to each other, like data equals PD, concat, data frame, and Fed funds. That won't work. 
Let's look at the error we get. Well, I didn't get an error. Let's take a look at the data frame to see what happened. Um, add interest rates to the data frame. I need to make this a list. So we're concatenating a list of data frames. We have the federal fed funds and the data frame. And I didn't get an error. So what happened? Aha. Um, we, and important piece of information, our interest rates index is also a date time index, just like our data frame currently. So we're going to be blending these together based on when the dates match. This is extremely common practice. Okay, so what I've done is I have combined the data frame and the federal funds or the original Yahoo Finance data frame and the federal funds data frame with the, uh, we have combined the federal funds data frame with the Yahoo Finance data frame because the data, the argument for our data frame, the argument for this function was our Yahoo Finance data frame. We got more information from the Federal Reserve Economic Database by calling in our series ID. And then we combined that response from the Federal Reserve Economic Databases API with the data frame provided by Yahoo Finance here using pandas concat. This is a function we're going to be using a lot. And the way you can, the way it works is as long as you have two consistent indices, in our case, using date time index in harmony with one another, you can concatenate those data frames. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. And it gets really complex really fast. In a future episode, we will probably have to work with um, how to use this best, what the different use cases are, outer versus inner merge, left versus right. There's a lot you can do with it. But it's going to be important when we're working with multiple APIs, which we're doing now. Now, that is going to be added to our main function. We're going to get the original data from Yahoo Finance. We're going to add interest rates from the Federal Reserve Economic Database. And we are going to print that down here at the bottom. Perfect. But you'll notice that our interest rate data goes way back to 1954. And our Yahoo Finance data does not. This is best shown in a plot, in my opinion. So we're going to move down to plt.plot data frame. And we're going to plot a list. Oh, we're going to plot two different things. Data frame close. Whoops. Because we merged it all. On uh, see, like, hmm. oh, this is going to be Fed funds. That's way better. Perfect. I left the column naming from our other, and then plt plot data frame adjust close. Cool. So now we have both. You can see that the even they're on the same index, which is a bad idea. The uh, what we could do is take the cumulative returns. I think that would make a much better plot. No. Yeah, because this is like 700 at the maximum 16 or something. So I'm going to take a second to change the plot a little bit because I think it'll make it better. I took in a small column from, or a small line from some of our other functions where I make a, a column in the data frame for assets cumulative returns. We're going to call this column asset returns nope what's wrong there's an underscore here okay so a little better the cumulative returns maximize at like 50 the federal reserves interest rates they go all the way up to about 20 in the 1980s that was chaotic <clears throat> i wasn't there i imagine it was chaotic so what we're going to do is we're going to drop the na values in this original data frame because we can't work with incomplete data the issue is, ah, we're all data frame equals equals this, and then we're gonna plot it again. Sweet, this is a cool chart. Our, I think it is. It, it it shows you, I think, sort of a story. Let's look at, for example, 2008. You can see, okay, despite economy doing really well with you know. They're doing great despite the interest rates being high because you have a lot of money when you're paying interest on mortgages. And then it all goes to shit. Uh, we realize that a lot of people can't pay these back. There's no way of doing it because people were making commissions off of the school interest rates while writing shit bonds. So we tank the interest rates. You can see that there's a clear relationship between how the equities market does and what interest rates are. So interest rates means that your cost of holding equity goes to zero when you drop the interest rates to zero, which they stayed at for like 12 years. This is good and bad. Good means unlimited growth. You can buy, you can 
have money, hold it for free. You can invest in anything you want. It doesn't matter. It's all just like a fun game pretty much for companies. Like, oh, just put more money into this because it doesn't cost us anything. Awesome. But while this is happening, while the stock market is growing, inflation starts to pick up. So inflation for the last four years uh, or the Trump presidency, it's I, that's not his fault. He's got many, but that's not one of them. Inflation sort of started to pick up again because of this low interest rates for so long. And the stock market did really well, even with this interest rates. Then we have COVID, which is this crash here. It looks relatively small now, but that's, that's COVID. So we tank the interest rates again. This is the relationship. When you make money cheaper, the stock market does better. So we drop them back to zero, and that actually does a really good job. It puts a lot of money back into the stock market. It makes people invest again. It gives people confidence. There's a lot of narratives around it that I sort of disagree with sometimes. But, you know, in the interest rates to zero, the stock market does really well. But now inflation's really bad. Um, we add another line to this chart, and that'll tell, like, the story, actually. And that's going to do it for episode one of this because it's starting to get a little bit long. In the next episode, we'll add a little bit more information, probably related to inflation, and try to come up with a trading strategy that uses a narrative with all of this data. Today, we've done something really important, and that's combined data from two different data providers, Yahoo Finance and the Federal Reserve Economic Database. This is about as easy as it can possibly be when both of them provide you relatively thorough, complete information, both given to you in a date time index that you can load in through pandas. This is like a data scientist's paradise, but in reality, it doesn't often look like this. For the purposes of this channel and the interests of our studies, this is great. Uh, we're going to work exclusively with Yahoo Finance and Fred for the next long time. All of our trading strategies are going to be, in one way or another, combining technical information developed from Yahoo Finance data and in for interest rate and inflation information from the Federal Reserve Economic Database. Those are just two examples of a pretty much unlimited amount of economic data, reliable quality economic database data that you can get from FRED. Um, and super exciting. Thanks for being part of this new chapter in the Sharp Research journey to provide investors and traders with a more competitive approach to trading building strategies and testing them. I look forward to seeing you in future episodes and until then, stay sharp.